Good morning and a happy Sabbath to you, and welcome to the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are so happy that you could join with us on this beautiful, sunny Sabbath morning. I just want to mention a few names I see that are joining us. We have Nalin Kamal, Keith Mason, Esther Singh Auntie, Patina Chambers, Dow, Stacey Ann Martin, Sunny Jack, Adela Vialva, Vasanta David, Juanita Swan, Rose, Merritt Gobezi, Shiny, Corinne Fender, Barbara Marie, Dee Patrickson, and Luke Walker. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for all whose names I didn't get to mention. This morning, I would like to read a verse that comes from the Bible in Psalms chapter 84, verse 11. It's just so sunny outside that I had to talk about this verse that had the sun in it. It says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. What a wonderful promise that God gives us in the Bible. You see, as it is seen many times in the Bible, God offers us a blessing, but there is also something that we have to do on our parts to gain that blessing. God offers us his light, his guidance, and his protection. He wants to give us both favor and honor. He will not hold back any blessing from us. Now for the condition. What we must do to obtain this special blessing is to walk uprightly. How exactly do we do this? Well, let's take a look at someone in the Bible that is called upright. This man is Job. What were the characteristics that he had? Along with being upright, Job was patient, enduring, he had self-control and temperance. But most of all, he was faithful to God even in the crisis he was facing. Let us keep these thoughts in mind as we enter into this new week, and may we always remember that God offers us his guidance, protection, favor, honor, and blessings to those who are faithful to him and live their lives according to the standard of Jesus. I would like to remind you that we at the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church are so blessed by all of you who join with us to worship our God. We need your prayers and financial support, and we thank God for those of you who are already doing so. I ask that you would support the various media ministries of this church, all who need your support, specifically the media ministry, who urgently needs your financial support. As time goes on, the cost of production increases, and we are at a point where our equipment needs to be upgraded because it is nearly a decade old and it's reached the end of its life. With your financial support, we will be able to upgrade this equipment to bring you more quality content. But in addition to reaching these goals, we will be fulfilling the will of God which is to further his kingdom. If you want to give, head over to our church website, click on the giving tab, select media ministries, and your generous donation will enhance our production and be a blessing to someone else. If you have been blessed and are in a position to give, then please consider supporting us. If you are not able to support us with your giving, please do support us with your prayers because those are even more important. Our main goal is to keep this ministry running to bless you and others. Inform your friends and families of the media ministries here at our church and ask if they too would be willing to support. Thank you for your support in the past, now, and in the future. Additionally, I would like to remind you that the praise and prayers service that we have in the afternoon or in the evening will be held at 5 o'clock. That's 5 p.m. today, and you can join via YouTube, Facebook, and Zoom and send in your requests. And as always, we really love to hear from you. You can visit our church website, remnantsdachurch.org, to request for prayers and for contacting us. Don't forget to leave your name, your number, and where you are reaching out to us from. Today's message is titled, The Body of God, His Hands and Feet, and is brought to us by our very own youth pastor, Reggie Samuel. We pray that we are a blessing to you, and once again, welcome to the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good morning. I want to wish each one of you a blessed and a happy Sabbath. It is indeed our privilege to come before God's throne of grace and worship him through our songs and praise. So let us join our our voices and sing praises to his holy name. For our first song, let's all turn our hymnals to hymn number 388. Don't forget the Sabbath. Hymn number 388. It brings people 
I am coming to the cross. Hymn number 307 will be our next song. 307. We'll sing the first, second, and the final stanza. Next hymn is going to be hymn number five, sorry, 152, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. I want to thank all my cousins in Australia who are worshipping with us. Happy Sabbath. Oh, my. 
when the roll is called up yonder, hymn number 216 will, will be our next song. 216. We'll sing only the first stanza. morning and happy Sabbath. For the health talk, I started with the wonderful fruit and the leaves of guava. And many scientists have studied this and have found to or come up with a reason why it's been a beneficial to us. Today I will be talking to you on the benefit of our heart health a boosting heart health. Since it has been proved that it has got a high level of antioxidant and vitamins, and also high level of potassium and fiber, this guava fruit and extracts from the leaf has helped improve the heart health. In addition to this, the guava leaf extract has also linked in increasing the good cholesterol and reducing the bad cholesterol LDL. And since high blood pressure and high level of LDL cholesterol are linked to a higher risk of heart disease and stroke, gova leaf extract has, has led or been beneficial to this protecting the heart from these problems. There are more beneficial from the fruit that many have been benefited. And there was a study for 12 weeks by the scientists and doctors who did, an, who did a test on 120 people who have been eating the goa fruit and taking the extract from the leaves. And what is the result of this outcome? Is that they were able to reduce the blood pressure by eight to nine points and reduce the total cholesterol by 9.9% and increase the good, uh, good cholesterol by 8%. Now we see that this fruit is found mostly in Central America and in Asia and so forth. I know many might ask, why am I talking here when you cannot find so much of it? Yes, you can find, if you go to the Asian stores, you can find the fruit at the season time. But there's also the extract and powder that's available in uh, health food stores that you can buy and use it. And conclusion, we see that the extract of the leaves and the fruit have a positive effect on heart health and also lowering blood pressure and decreasing bad cholesterol and increasing the good cholesterol. Hope this has been helped to you today.
Good morning and a very, very happy Sabbath to all of you who are in the sanctuary today because you've come here to participate in the divine service and uh, God has a special blessing for each one of you who has come in here today to do something to enhance the worship services this morning. I want to also welcome all our remnant Seventh-day Adventist members who have tuned in to our online worship this morning. You've been at home for over a year now, but don't get too comfortable because very soon, God willing, we will open our doors and we will have all of you back here in our empty pews to worship along with us. So welcome to our regular members, to our well-wishers, to our visitors, and we have quite a few people, I don't have the names, who are worshiping from different parts of the world. Um, in India, in uh, the islands, the Virgin Islands, and the Grenadines, and Bermuda, and uh, Australia, uh, from last night, um, a family of ours from uh, all the way from Darwin in Australia have been tuning in. Um, and right now, even though it's past midnight for them, they have tuned in to worship with us as long as they can stay awake. So welcome to the Mason family in Darwin, Australia. We're so glad that you could worship with us. Uh, there's just a, a one announcement that I would like to share with you. Uh, it's about our mango sales that we do every year to raise funds for our church building mortgage payments and stuff like that. Uh, as was announced, I think a week or two ago, the cost has gone up after all these years by $2 a box. So instead of being the usual $10, it's now $12. And uh, you can pick up these boxes from right here on the church campus weekdays after 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I am told. And if you don't live too far away from the church area, they could even be delivered to your home if you call either the pastor or Mr. Surinda Moses, who was up here before me just a minute ago. And they will help you to receive your boxes of mangoes. Yes, I said boxes. Don't buy one, buy five or 10 or 15. Um, but uh, that's the only announcement I have. Um, again, so happy that all of you could join us from wherever you may be around the world to worship with us on this beautiful Sabbath morning. When I was coming, it was just 71 degrees. That's beautiful weather by my standards. Um, but it could get warmer later in the day. But, you know, God is good. Um, just wanted to read one text from Psalm 145. Yes, Psalm 145, and I'm reading verse 14 from the King James Version. Um, it says, The Lord upholdeth all that fall, and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Are you bowed down with burdens and cares? A lot of people around the globe have succumbed to this horrible pandemic that has gripped the world in fear and sickness, and a lot of people are downhearted. But the promise is here in Psalm 145, verse 14. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Keep this promise in your heart as we continue to worship our living and loving God. God bless each one of you.
Our hymn of praise for this morning will be hymn number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, hymn number 469. As we begin our worship, we will uh, be seeking the Lord in prayer this morning, and I'll be presenting, we will be presenting four sealed requests to the Lord, which he knows the contents of, and I'll also be reading the names of those that have requested prayer today, and they are Mehareth, Samson Fazge, Robin and Parveen Peter, Maxwell, Paul and family, Sula Pillay, Dr. and Mrs. C.P. Matthew, Babu Benjamin, Shirley Harris, Annie Rainey, Wansa, Gray Johnston, Rajni Prashotham, Lizzie Aroldas, Isaac Chavan, Anne Matthew, Prathap and Isaac, Mr. and Mrs. Aroldas, J.S. Paul, M.L. John, Janet Smith, Esther Singh, Brian and family, Ruthi, Lakshma Beckham, Jane Subhadra, Shashi Massey, Vimala and Bincy Mathai, John Gorday, Esther and Sheila Gorday, Murthy, Jenny Sampson and Brandon, Nirmala Chavan, Maya Foster, Kokila Patel, Ponzi and family, Bridget Abraham, Priya Anand, Satya Narayana, Sampath Kumari, Lavlina Rao and Laban, Jainthi Eshwar Rao, Anne and Santosh, Vikas Soma, Carol and Jerry and family, Jason, Marvin, Dow and siblings, Stacy Ann Martin and family and staff, Alicia, Jesse and family, Irene, Shanta, Mary Edwards, Ronnie and Morley, Carlos, Saul Florence, Sunny Jack and family, Sydney, Lizzie Thomas, T.S. Abraham, Dalip Anusha Simpson, Bobby and Joy Kurian, Rita, Nita and Aruna Chavan, Mr. Rasanayagam, Amber Batra, Patricia, Sue Benjamin, Molly Nuthlapati, Pastor Sajjan and family, Pastor Reggie and family, Mrs. C.K. John, Mason and family, Christopher Cole, Zabata and family, 
the Carley family, Jackie, Ralph, Jason, Philomena and Grace, Gill family, Ellen Cromwell, Mr. and Mrs. Gurupatham, Margaret Gurupatham, Edwin Joseph, Allison, James, Tanya and Linda, Dion and Lorna, Lavina, Rosa Hernandez, Merlin Varghese, Premila Yedla, Arush Sable, Suresh Salvaraja, Diamond and family, Pearson and Paulson Tharpatla, Lavina Rakshe, Sanatan Rakshe, Maloti and Santosh, Joan Go John Gomes, Sanjay Chavan, Pastor Henry and Sharon Fordham, Louis, Mrs. Thomas, Joseph, Edna Venkatraj, Aman, Sarah and John Kandagle, Mervyn Singh, Brijesh and wife, Amy Leitner, Isaiah Delos, Braxton, uh, K. Shant Shantaraj and family, and Dr. Sam. Wherever you are, how far as possible, I invite you to kneel as we are led in prayer by uh, our elder David Roberts. Let's pray. Almighty Father, loving God, it is indeed our privilege, our humble privilege, to come before your throne of grace on this beautiful Sabbath morning. While we may be few in number that have gathered in this house of worship this morning, we know and you know too, O oh Father, that your children are gathered before their TVs and their laptops and their handheld devices to join us in our worship this morning, not just around this Burtonsville area here in Maryland, but wherever our members live in Maryland or in other states of this great country. Indeed, there are so many that have joined us to worship you this morning from other countries around the globe. I pray that you will bless every head that is bowed before you this morning. Right here where a few people can see me and right across the globe where they may be seeing me on their devices. But I ask that they don't see me. I ask that they look on you and for you this morning. Just to say, thank you, God for allowing us to be your children. And for allowing us to see another Sabbath in our lives. This morning we want to thank you and we do thank you. And we praise you for life and health and strength. We thank you for the marvelous blessings that you continually shower upon each one of us and which one of us is worthy to receive anything from you. But you don't look at us the way we look at each other. You look at us through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And that is why you are so merciful and gracious 
to each one of us. We thank you for Calvary. We thank you for your son. We thank you for his spilt blood that has bought us and that has redeemed us. And so I pray that you will accept our worship, that you will bend your ear to us as we praise you, as we lift our petitions to you, as we lift our hearts to you, that you will not just hear my voice, but you will read the desires of each heart that is listening to this prayer this morning. And as you read their hearts, you will know their inmost desires as well, things and blessings that they need from you. And I pray that you will pay close attention to each one. This morning, O oh Father, we lay before you this world that is reeling from this disease that has laid low thousands upon thousands of people in every country, in every continent on this planet. Every day we get news from back home, even in India, that somebody's sons have been taken away, that somebody's mother has been taken away, that someone's father has been taken away, that somebody's daughter is fighting for life. that brothers are weeping for their sisters and vice versa. I pray that you will be so close to each one of those who has suffered a loss. Even as I speak, there are people still in the hospital trying to recover from COVID. I think of Jesse Gopal Rao, still in the hospital from January. But we thank you for your merciful touch of healing that has put her on the road to recovery. Amidst the gloom, we see your bright shining light. And we thank you for it. We thank you for your healing. We thank you for your mercy. Continue to be with every member of this church, every elderly person, every young person, every child. We know that we are your children, O oh Father. We know that you do not want us to suffer this way. And we pray that there will be an end soon to this and that you will heal this world and remove this scourge that has laid it low in every corner of the globe. Oh Father, we thank you this morning that we have come to listen to your word. We thank you for your servant, our youth pastor, Reggie Samuel, and for the dynamic way that you have used him in the few years that he has been with us. As he speaks to us and brings your word to us this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit will hover over him, that he will be blessed with holy unction, Touch his lips, that the words he utters will be from your throne of grace. That it will be words that will show us who you are. 
and let the world know who you are. That you are our living and everlasting God. Bless him as he speaks to us this morning. I pray that you will be with him and his wife Maria, that you will bless our senior pastor, Sergeant John, and his wife and family, that you will bless all the elders, the deacons and the deaconesses, and that you will bless the head of every department as they join hands to make sure that the programs of this church are not stopped. We are so privileged that we can continue every weekend with our services. It is only because of your blessing and your desire that these programs continue from Friday till Saturday set of sun. And we thank you that we have been a blessing that we can reach through our gifted and talented media ministry team that we can reach all these wonderful, beautiful children of yours who have joined to worship with us from different parts of the USA and from different parts of this world. If I were to take time to mention names, our pastor would not have enough time to bring your word to us. But you know every single person who has tuned in to worship you this morning. I pray that you will enter every heart and every home through your spirit and that you will give to each one your special Sabbath blessing that you have promised. And if there is one person who keeps his promises, it is you, O oh Father. Your promises never fail. So enfold us in your arms this morning. Forgive us of our sins, willful sins, unknown sins, accidental sins. Make us fit beings for that time and for that day when your son will come in the clouds of glory and gather us home to your kingdom. Make us fit for that day. We ask all these blessings in his precious name. Amen and amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. For about 15 months, our church doors are locked. But the services and the ministries of this church never stopped. We never missed any service, even though we had bad weather like snow. Even though we are worshiping from various parts of the world, with different timing, we are able to worship at the same time. Praise God for the technology he has given us. On behalf of Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church, we want to thank all of you who support our church through your prayers, through tithes, and your offerings. Thank you very much. Please continue to support us. We need your help. While you prayerfully contemplate on supporting our church, we have a ministry in music by Shadrach and Hannah Suresh.
let us pray for the offering our most heavenly father we thank you for giving us one more sabbath as we have brought the portion of the blessings bless the offering bless the tithe and offering bless people from various parts of the world who are supporting this church bless people who are unable to support but they are praying for us hear their prayer and answer us father bless our church bless our pastors bless pastor raji samuel as he brings the message be with him help us to understand the message and walk into walk according to thy will once again i pray thee to bless the offering use it for thy cause finally save us all in thy kingdom i pray in jesus name amen today's children story is brought to us by robin peter children please come close to your tvs or whatever the device you have don't forget your lamb's offering thank you Away, away, move away, move away. Let me see who's here. Move away, I can't see. This little three-foot-old gentleman was trying to see Jesus. I said, three foot, right there. And Jesus took notice, but he still couldn't see Jesus. Move, let me see, let me see, move away. Then he said, well, this is too hard. All of these giants, I can't push them away. So he saw a tree close by. And he said, mm-hmm, let me climb up that tree. Wow! Oh, there's a cat there. Watch out. He moves away on the other branch. And of course, he almost slipped. Yes, now I see. I see. There he is. Jesus, oh, wow, he doesn't look any different than we are. Everybody has a big story to tell. And sure enough, when Jesus came close, Jesus looked up. And he said, Zacchaeus, what are you doing up there? And he looked down and he said, Jesus, I came to see you. He said, Zacchaeus, come on down. We are going to your house today. How about that? If Jesus comes to you right now and says, let's go, let's go to your house and have lunch. Wouldn't that be awesome? Now Zacchaeus, according to the Bible, was not a good man. He worked the wrong way. He cheated people. He went around and got too much stuff that was wrong, but became rich. He had everything he wanted, but something lit in his heart that he needs to see Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he found salvation. That's how we should be. Our hearts should lean towards good things not to do bad things and become big and strong. Jesus takes care of us if we only let him do our stuff. So Jericho, I mean, Zacchaeus just was so happy, he couldn't believe him. He came down and he stood beside him and he says, Jesus, are you sure? And the people that were around, even his Jesus' disciples, were amazed and were shocked at Jesus going to a person who treats his own people bad, and he's going to treat him as a 
big person, as a righteous person, as a good person. And Jesus knew what was going on in their mind. And that evening, salvation followed Zacchaeus to his house. Zacchaeus confessed. Zacchaeus said, I'm going to do no bad things anymore. He became a good man. And so salvation went from his house to other people that saw the change in him. Boys and girls, example is do good, and good will follow you everywhere.
And amen, how true it is. He is the only one who cares. He is the God of the mountains. He is God of the valley. Cornerstone, thank you so much for blessing with the song, for lifting our spirit up, for giving us a little taste of heaven. We truly appreciate our young people and the talents that they are using for God's glory, and we praise God for it. It gives me great privilege to Join hands with the youth pastor, Reggie Samuel, and all the elders of the Remnant Church to welcome all of you for our divine hour. We are so happy that you have chosen to worship with us. You have many choices to make. Almost every church is streaming their services. But for you to choose the Remnant Church, we are privileged. And we want you to know that we are blessed by you being part of the extended family of the Remnant Church. May the Lord, Lord richly bless you as you continue to worship with us in spirit and in truth. We do have a number of names here, and uh, we also would like to thank Shadrach for playing, for providing us the special music. Just a closer walk with you, Lord. This is my plea, my prayer that that will be the plea of each one of us as we walk in our daily journey. We do have Esther Singh, Bettina Chambers, Dow Taylor from Canada, Stacey Ann Martin, Sunny Jack from St. Vincent, Delhi Vailwa, Vasantha David, Vaughan Swan, Rose K, Meheret, Shiny, Connie Fender, Barbara from Mountain View, California, D. Patterson, Luke Walker, Ponzi from New York, Hernandez from Philadelphia, Grace Samuel, Clifton Coilpillay. Then we have er Erida from St. Vincent. Then we have Maurice Madhu from Pune, India, Pradeep Suranjan from Bangalore, India, Alamgir Khan, Rita Chavan from Pune, India, Pradeep Suranjan, Susan Lagambi from Philippines, Prabhu Vergis from UK, Sony Bhavani, Charlotte from South Africa, Rafael Suleiman from Philadelphia, and as uh, uh, one of our elders, David Roberts, did make a mention, the cousins all the way from Australia. You have joined us to worship you, and it's our privilege to have you. And may the Lord richly bless each one of you as we worship him in spirit and in truth. This morning, uh, the people that have presented the flowers, we have the first set of flowers that we have on the piano as well as on the organ. It is presented to us by Sham and Priscilla and Ruby and Alex to thank God for Samantha. Not only she completed her course, she graduated from the law school, but she also got the dream of her life to get a job at Red Cross because her passion is to work for international humanitarian need. And so that is what she was looking for. So may the Lord richly bless you. So Samantha, along with your husband, Alex, and with your parents and your sister, we want to thank God for your life, for the success you have had. And as you begin a new journey in your life, may the Lord richly bless you. The second set of flowers that you find here is presented to us by Raju and Manju and Arpit and Prerna. And uh, they would like to thank for the way the Lord has blessed me and the ministry here at Remnant Church. And Manju and uh, Raju, along with your children, thank you for your love and for your fellowship and for your encouragement for the ministry of the Remnant Church. We truly appreciate that. This morning, it is also a privilege to rejoice with uh, Rhoda and Emeka and Amara for allowing Mr. Godwin their father, to celebrate their, his 87th birthday. So Mr. Godwin, along with your uh, dear wife, and also with your children and your grandchildren and your daughter-in-law, we would like to join hands with them to thank God for your life, for God allowing you to enter into another new year in your life, not just any ordinary year, 87th year. God has been extremely good to you. And may the Lord richly bless you. May this new year be a godly year, a year we will have a closer walk with you. Just want to give an update. June 4th and 5th of uh, next month, it's going to be the Youth and Collegiate Weekend. Kindly keep the 
youth in your prayer and the collegian in your prayer as they lead out in these weekend services. Then June 11th and 12th is going to be the women's ministry weekend, where all the women will take care of the whole weekend, the Vespers, the Sabbath school, the divine service, as well as the evening prayer service. So kindly keep these groups in your mind as they lead out in the ministry of the church. I so pastor, whenever there is uh, an overflow of your giving, I do say it out from here is to thank you for your sacrificial and for your faithful giving. It is also my burden when we are short in our funds to make it known to you. For the month of April, we were short by $1,500 for our building fund. So I want to urge everyone who has made a commitment, if you can be a little more faithful, be a little more consistent, let me put the word, that's a better word, be a little more consistent in your giving so that we will be able to meet the financial needs of the church, especially with our mortgage. As I've been saying this, we got to raise $15,000 every month towards the mortgage. And keep in mind, if there is no building, there is no ministry. So we want to thank you for your giving. We thank you for your sacrifices. We truly appreciate that. The Lord has brought us thus far. And may I urge you to give a little more sacrificially so that we will be able to catch up with the shortcomings that we have had. We truly appreciate your giving. We regret to announce the death of Mr. Sunimal Kulaseke, wife of Vasanda Devashi. He passed away in Michigan. And also we have a number of names. Uh, Paul Raj Kamaldini passed away in India, in Udupi. Is, uh, that is the husband of Solochana, Paul Raj. Then we have Esther John, the mother of uh, Susama Kale, passed away in Kotarakara. C.P. Mohan, the principal of Jalahali School, and uh, Satyamuthi, the principal of Kalkari High School in Bangalore, also passed away because of COVID-19. We also have Lakshmi Kant uh, Shinde in Pune, he passed away, and uh, Mrs. Pearson David, again in Pune, passed away as a result of COVID-19. They lost their, she, the family lost their, the, the father, PM, Pastor DM David, and now we have Mrs. Pierce and David passing away. We also regret to announce the death of Mrs. T.J. Lazarus in Bangalore and Babu Gurubatham again in Bangalore. So kindly keep these families in your prayers. And as most of you know, a good number of them are in their, are in their ICU beds. So kindly keep these families in New Delhi, in Pune, in Kerala, in Bangalore and other places. And may the Lord richly be very close to each one of them. And it's my prayer that the Lord would hearken unto a cry. You see, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, make things right with God, turn from our wicked ways, the Lord promises that he will hear our prayer, forgive our sins, and heal the land. So our cry out should be, Lord, please heal this planet Earth. It is not the vaccination that's going to put an end to it, but God's mighty hand can put an end to it. So kindly keep them all People, not only in uh, India, but also in Turkey, in other places around the world, even South America. So kindly keep the families in your prayers. It appears as though a few months ago or so, I, we had the privilege of welcoming uh, our youth pastor, Reggie Samuel, along with Maria. I'm going to ask both of them if they can come up here for a minute, please. Maria and uh, Reggie, if you can come up here. For the last four years, uh, Reggie, along with his dear wife Maria, have been a great blessing to the Remnant Church. Through their uh, gifts, through their preaching, through his uh, guidance, and through anything and everything that they have done, they have been a great blessing to the Remnant Church. And uh, Reggie and Maria, we want to thank you for all the commitment that you have done, for your dedication for the Remnant Church. And I, as a pastor, I have been blessed by your ministry, and we truly appreciate that. Maria, along with uh, Reggie, you have been a blessing to us, and we want to thank you. And I'm sure that every one of you, even the ones who have joined us on live broadcast, would attest to the fact that they have been a great blessing, not only to us as the grown-ups, but also to the youth. Now, let me share first the, the good news, and then I'll share you the not-so-good news. Reggie, along with his dear wife, Maria, have... Uh, Served this church for a little over four years. And uh, 
although they are going to move to Texas to be with their in-law, with, with his in-laws, here's the good news. He is going to continue to be the part of the pastoral family of the Remnant Church. He will continue to be the youth pastor. At the same time, he will also be taking up a heavy, another responsibility that I've been dealing, I've been talking to him and that I, met, uh, that I talked with the church board also. He will also be focusing on the digital evangelism of the remnant church, under the umbrella of the remnant church. Now, the last few, few weeks ago when we had the workers meeting at the Allegheny East Conference, the emphasis was on digital ministry. And uh, many hours were spent in making the presentation as to the urgent need of the church to emphasize on digital ministry. Here are some facts. Almost 16 to 18 hours a millennial person spends on social media. So out of 24 hours, almost three-fourths of the time is spent on social media. When the millennials were asked well, how many of them are planning to go back to church once the church doors are opened, only 20% said we will consider going back to the church. And so you have 80% of the youth and the millennials who may not get into the, into the sanctuary, to within the four walls of a sanctuary, but we got to reach them because God died for them too. And so there is an urgent need that we need to reach out to the ones outside of the four walls of the sanctuary because the word says, go ye into all the world. We got to go where people are. And so Reggie, along with the youth pastor's job, he has agreed to work with us on this, where he will be producing videos and, and podcasts and other areas as to how to reach the young people. In fact, some of the main questions that is Googled, on the, that is Googled are like, is God real? What happens when people die? Why there is so much suffering? Some of these current very pertinent questions to our youth and our young people uh, Youth Pastor will be addressing through his media ministry. And so, Reggie, thank you so much for accepting to do that. And by the way, he was, when I shared with him the first time, he said, Pastor, it was very interesting. Last December, when I, there was no thought of me moving to Texas, that I started gathering up a coupon that I need to do this. God works in a mysterious way. God knew the, the future. So you knew that down the road that he will have to use this. And so that's the reason he has agreed to do that. And so we want to thank you both you and Maria, for willing to be part of the pastoral staff of the Remnant Church. Now, while he is going to be in Texas, he is going to have a right-hand person here. I'm going to ask Matthew Rajaratnam if he can come up here. I took up this matter with the pastor's council, and then we made the recommendation of the church board. The church board met last Saturday, and I'm happy to announce to you that Rich that Matthew Rajaratnam will be our youth leader. He will be guided, he'll be mentored by Reggie Samuel, our youth pastor, and of course we will be here and I'll be here to guide him through. And so we, here we have an young man who has, who has a passion, who has a commitment to do this, and I'm sure that the good Lord is going to use him mightily. He's bilingual, he's able to speak Spanish, and here's another thing that I like to do, along with Reggie reaching out to the youth through social media. We are also going to use Hindi, Punjabi, Spanish, different languages, how to reach the unreached with the everlasting gospel. So there are many plans, many visions that has been laid out, and I know with your giving, with your wisdom, with your support, members of the Remnant Church, I'm very confident that we will be able to reach greater heights because if the Lord has brought us thus far, he's surely going to take it to completion. That the word of God says, he who has a begin, begin a good work in you will take it to completion. And so, Matthew, welcome to the Remnant Church and for being part of us today and moving forward. And may the Lord richly bless you. We are happy that uh, your, your parents are here along with your uh, siblings to show their support. And we are also happy to have here Ashok Wilmot, the grandson of Dr. Wilmot. We know your grandfather. So that's the reason I'm trying to make the connection. He's doing his... Uh, his ministry at Andrews. May the Lord richly bless you also as you prepare your hearts to serve the Lord in the near future. I requested our elders, our head elder, Elder C.P. Matthew, and also our uh, chairman of the board, Pastor Samuel Messi, if you can also join us here, and uh, Mr. Maxwell Paul, again one of our elders. Sham, again one of you, if you can come up here as we offer a special prayer on these two families. 
and that's my prayer that each one of you will continue to give your support because they do, and of course, uh, David Roberts, please do come up here and join us here. They need our support. They need our encouragement. They need our wisdom. They need our guidance. Remember this, we can only work together. It is not I kill the elephant, it is what? We kill the elephant. That is how we come accomplish the Lord's work. And I have been a recipient of your support all these 11 years or so, and I want to thank you for that. And I'm sure you're going to extend the same hand of fellowship and support to Reggie as he continues to be part of us and also to Matthew Rajaratnam as he serves the youth as the youth leader. I'm going to request if you can come in the center here and we as elders, if you can surround them, we would, uh, yeah, come right next to them. If you can come right behind them. Father of love and tender mercies, giver of life and life urban, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning on the Holy Sabbath day, Lord, our hearts are filled with gratitude, our lips are filled with praises for being in the stand on the land of the living. Well, thousands of people are confined to their hospital beds, and many are dying in different parts of the world, including our home country, India. In your grace, in your mercy, you have spared our lives and allowed us to see this beautiful Sabbath day, and we want to thank you. It is nothing but your grace and nothing but your mercies, and we acknowledge that today. At the same time, we also want to request that your grace, your mercy will be extended to those people, especially in India and other places where they are being infected with this COVID-19. Loving God, that you would reach out to them in your own mysterious way, that you would touch them, that you would heal them, be with the members. A number of families have lost their loved ones, that you would be very gracious to them. May the hope of the resurrection be rekindled in their hearts. May you be the source of comfort. May you be the source of strength to them. And now, loving Father, we want to thank you as I join with the elders here for the service and for the ministry of Reggie along with his dear wife, Maria, for the last four years. As he continues to serve us, not only as the youth pastor, but also as the, as the digital ministry pastor, that you would bless him, that you would give him the needed wisdom as to what are the things that he can do so that we might be able to reach the unreached beyond the boundaries of this campus here. We request you that you continue to bless him today as he ministers to us, as he breaks the bread of life, that you touch his sleep so that every word that comes out of his mouth would lift our hearts to heaven above. I also pray, Lord, that you'd be with Maria. We want to thank you for the way that she has stood by her husband, for the talent that she has used to uplift our worship experience. Please be very kind and gracious to her. I also request you, Lord, in a very special way that you'd be with Matthew Rajaratnam as he joins the pastoral team here as the youth leader. We want to thank you, Lord, for his uh, willingness to work with us. We thank you, Lord, for the, for the way that you have prepared the way for him, for the training that he received, for the blessing that you have showered upon him. Even on his, uh, on his missionary trip to Peru, how you used him, how you blessed him, not only to learn the language, but to minister to the people there. And so as he joins with the remnant church, I plead with you, Lord, that you would embrace him with your love, that you would fill him with your spirit, take control of him, that he would realize that he, that he is here to serve you and to uplift your holy name and to be as of service to your people. And so please be with him. Continue to bless him. Give him the needed wisdom, the needed patience, the needed love. And so loving Father, as we work here as the pastoral team, may we realize that we are nothing but mere instruments in your hand. You are the one to empower us. You are the one to enable us. You are the one to guide us. You are the one to guide, lead us every step of the way. And so we commit ourselves to your care and keeping. Feeble, weak, and, and sinful as we are, thank you for choosing these weak vessels as, like us. Please, empower us, use us for your kingdom. And now as we lay our hands upon the pastors here, I plead with you, Lord, that, that as we dedicate them for your service, we do so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, Reggie, thank you so much. Again, Matthew, God bless you as you, be, as you join us here.
Happy Sabbath. The scripture reading for today's divine service is taken from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, verses 36 to 39. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. May the Lord add his blessings to the portion of the reading. Happy Sabbath, church. Thank you. Uh, those of you that, a few that are in here, it's good to hear a couple of voices respond. Um, and those of you online, I do have my, um, I do see you on the screen here. So if you want to make a comment or anything as we go through the sermon, I will see it. So if you want to say an amen or I didn't get that, um, I will be able to respond, even though you know, we're trying to find different ways to be able to engage with those that are worshiping with us online, which is, 99% of you, and uh, so we have to find different ways of doing that. I can't hear you audibly, but I can see you send in your messages. I'm gonna have my, I have YouTube up on here, um, so I can see those. And I saw a few of you uh, wishing me and my wife well as we make a transition to a new place that God has for us while we still are able to minister to those people here. Um, as Pastor said, God works in mysterious ways, and if you asked me three months ago what I'd be doing, I'd be here like I have been in Maryland for the past 33 years, my entire life. But things work out in different ways, and I found out, especially I've learned after taking, uh, accepting to be able to be the youth pastor here at the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church, that the best place you can be is the place that God wants you to be. And the place you want to be is often the worst place that you can find yourself if it's not where God wants you to be. And so we'll just follow God's leading, and we've seen him work, and we pray. Uh, we ask that you continue to keep us in your prayer, but we will not be far. We'll st you'll still be seeing my face, so if you've gotten tired of it, too bad. It's still going to be up there on the screen every so often. Um, we're going to continue the series I've, we've been st we started back in February, and uh, it's titled The Body of God. Previous to this, we looked at the body of Christ talking about the church. But I thought it was a fitting to talk about the body of God. Because literally, even though we know God is spirit, that God uses imagery to allow us to understand more about him. So we talked about in our first sermon, starting from the top, God's mind. What is God's mind like? And if you're God, you're omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, well, you're everything. But God's mind, we found, is filled with pride. I'm filled with humility, while Satan's mind is filled with pride. How can a God who knows so much, who is so much, who is everything, from whom all things exist, have humility? And we studied that. And then I had to ask my, we had to ask ourselves, what is your mind filled with? Pride or humility? And the reason we're going through this study is because I made this suggestion to you at the beginning of our journey, which is the type of God you believe in will be the type, of, the type of person you become. If you believe in a judgmental, uh, vengeful, angry God, don't be surprised when you find yourself being the same way. And so as we went through this, as we go through the study, 
I want you to keep in mind that we're not studying this just to understand facts or learn things from the Bible, but actually because I want you to change how you see God so that we in ourselves will be more like the real picture of God and not the fake one that we've painted. So we talked about God's mind, then we talked about God's ears, how God hears our cries. He hears the cries we said of the afflicted. He can hear the cries of people experiencing injustice and pain and persecution and how fitting that is for the time we live in now. God hears the cries of the voiceless, those who cannot speak for themselves, those who have been blotted out, those in society who say something and we don't hear. He hears the voice of the blood of the used, abused, and cut down. We talked about that regarding Abel's blood crying out to the Lord. And finally, we talked that God hears the cries of his children. In our third sermon, we talked about God's eyes. What is it that God sees? We said that God sees the evil and takes no pleasure in it. He sees the good and rejoices in it, but he also sees the hidden. And the two things we talked about God seeing in the hidden is the secrets. God sees what no one else sees, that no one else knows, the hidden things of your mind and your hidden misdeeds. Still, he does not turn away, but pleads for you to turn after, turn to him so that you will see his love. He doesn't run away from your secrets, so stop keeping them secret from him. And finally, he sees the invisible you. We talked about Hagar, how God can see the person no one else sees. The person no one else respected. The person no one else knew. She was invisible to society, but not to the eyes of God. Because he is El Roi, the God who sees. And last, our last sermon that we had was entitled God's Heart. We talked about the love of God. And we use the acronym of the heart, H-E-A-R-T, to say that God's love is a love that heals. It is eternal. It is active. It is a love that restores And it is certainly a love that is thorough. Heart. God's heart is one that heals, is eternal, is active, it restores, and is thorough. I always like to do a little review in case there's someone new joining us, or you missed the sermon, or, like me, you forgot what you preached about previously. So I always find that doing a quick review, or if it's something that sounded interesting to you and you didn't get a chance to listen to it, you can go back on our YouTube page and find the sermon to, uh, uh, to be able to get the full picture of what we've been studying. Today we're going to study God's hands and feet. Originally I was going to have this in two separate sermons, um, but because of, as Pastor mentioned, I'll be leaving. I won't probably be speaking for a a little bit of time. I will be speaking at the Youth and Collegiate Sabbath, but we have a different theme for that. And so by the time I get around to a sermon for here, it might be uh, several months from now. In order to take advantage of the momentum we've been building since February, five sermons in the past four, four months or so, three months, Um, I wanted to put these two together. So just join with me for the next couple of hours, and we will get through it. I'm just joking. It won't take that long. But I I have concatenated this sermon a little bit in order that we can talk to each other and learn more about God's hands and feet. Before we begin, let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being who you are. And today, Lord, I ask that you hide me behind your cross. May you be seen more clearly today. Forgive me my sin, touch my lips, that I may be able to speak your words to us so that we will be able to know you better is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. When you think about your hands and your feet, um, I want you to think as we go through the sermon, what is it that you do with your hands and your feet? You say, oh, that's easy, right? You know, I walk with my feet. No, but where, where do you go? What is it that you do? You know, we can use our hands for, uh, uh, my, my wife's hands are very good at cooking. She's a wonderful cook, and she can put all sorts of things together, and she gets grabs one bottle. It's not labeled. It all looks the same to me from all the other bottles that are in the spice jar, and she takes that one. She puts them in. She, she, she uses her hands for that, and oh, what a blessing that is. What is it that you use your hands for, your feet for? You go to work. Uh, some, of, some of you that are joining us, maybe you're a surgeon. Maybe you use your hands to clean your house like I do. Uh, Use it to do laundry. And until you've lost the function of using one of those limbs, do you realize how precious that limb was? Even if it was just one hand. Even if it was just a few fingers. You begin to realize, wow, 
all this time I didn't even realize how important this was. And there's many people living without an arm or arms. Or people who can no longer walk and go to the store like you do. They can no longer go for a run. And I want you to think about your hands and your feet. What you use them for as you are able. Um, Those that know me know I love sports of any kind. Any kind. I'm up for a sport any day. And uh, I I like to use my hands and my feet for sports. Whether it be shooting a basketball, throwing a football. Uh, Recently I've been getting into soccer. Uh, I've never really played it, but that's why they make me the goalie. Um, but either way, you get to use your hands because I'm better with my hands than my feet. And so, but now I've, as I've been playing and doing more, uh, playing a little more soccer, I'm getting a little better at using my feet to kick the ball where I actually want to go. Before I kick it, and then I'm looking there, and then the ball is ending up to my immediate 90 degree angle to my left, uh, 180 degree angle to my left. What is it that you do? Because as you use something, and I'll, you can mention, think about this, when someone loses function who's a right-handed person, they lose function in their right hand, all of a sudden, although their left hand used to be weak, what ends up happening? It becomes stronger. You become able to do more because the more you exercise the thing you have, the things you have, the more you'll be able to do with it. But if you're sedentary, if you choose not to use them, Muscles can atrophy within days. Ask those that have been in, this, in, a, in a hospital bed for a few, few days. Your muscles begin to atrophy and to learn to walk again if you've been in the bed for two or three weeks. God wants us to be active with our hands and our feet as we are capable in the ways and places he's put us. And so as we go through the sermon, in this long, after this long introduction is done, I want you to, as we talk about what God's hands and feet do, think about your own. What is it that you've been using them for? Have they been for God's glory? Have they been in the ways that God used them himself? Let's think about that. Now let's go to, so let's go to number one. His hands. God's hands. His hands reached out to do, and we'll talk about three things. Not an exhaustive list. His hands reached out to number one, heal. Number two, to lead. And number three, to save. Let's get, jump right into it. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, verse 34. Matthew 20, verse 34. And as you turn there, I'll remind you of what we read in our um, uh, scripture reading, which was found in Acts chapter 10, verses 36 to 39. And it said there that what God, when Jesus was here, what he did was, is he went all around, all, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. When God is with you, you will go about doing good. Matthew 20, verse 34 says, So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. This is the two blind men that came after Jesus and kept yelling, uh, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And they're like, stop yelling, stop yelling. And Jesus finally stops And he says, the Bible says, Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Look what he did. Jesus had compassion. Then he touched their eyes. Now in order to do that, he had to use his hands to reach out and touch the blind man's eyes. And look what he does also. And again, this is not exhaustive, but just another example. Matthew 8, verse 3. I took this from the NIV. If I don't have the version of the Bible on the screen, it's because it's from the NKJV, the New King James Version, which is the version I like to use. Um, If it's not that, I'll let you know what version I'm taking it from. And then Matthew 8, verse 3 says, Jesus reached out. Look at that. Look what Jesus does with his hand. This is God himself. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. This is the leper he's speaking to who wanted to be healed. And Jesus says, because the the leper says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, yes, I am willing. Be clean. He reached out and touched. What is it that we do with our hands with others? In both of these examples, I find that it's not just that Jesus reached, but Jesus reached and touched. As Christians, as church-going people, we can often reach out by praying to God, but never actually touch somebody. We do a lot of reaching, but we stay arm's length away in order that we don't touch. 
But Jesus would go to a man who is a leper, which is called an untouchable, and says, I will reach out and touch you because I am willing. Are we willing as Christ's followers to reach out to someone who may be an untouchable? Whose society has labeled an untouchable. But God's hands, he, his hands are one that reach out to heal. Our hands, do we find sometimes, are reaching out in order to push away. God's hands reach out in order to bring that person into communion with him. Our hands can sometimes reach out in order to push that person out of communion with us. And I'm talking about the people that are good. I'm talking about the people that we need to push out of our lives. What is it that we use our hands for? I wish, you know, no matter what the case is, even during the time of the pandemic, what is it that people wish they could do when they could no longer do it? Touch somebody. To be able to hug your grandparents. You know, seeing those YouTube videos of people making screens of plastic so that they could go around and, you know, go through the plastic and be able to hug someone during the pandemic. Because in human touch, there's something that's like no other. When a, a friend of mine's father passed away, I remember he came home. I was there first when his father passed away. And his, his, his mother was there. He came into the house and he said no words. He just went straight to his mom and hugged her. I have that picture in my mind. Because words are no comparison for human touch. There is something about touch that tell, lets us know, I not only see you, but I accept you. That's what his hands would do. They are uh, 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 hands that would reach out and heal even those that society said were untouchable. That's what God's hands did. Number two, his hands reach out to lead. His hands reach out to lead. And I want you to think about this in a different way. We can often think, have you ever, if, uh, I don't have kids of my own, but I've had, I have eight nephews. Um, no nieces. Eight nephews. And, you know, these nephews, when they were young, they've all grown up, but they're always running around. You know, when babies are running around. And they'll run to anywhere. And what happens is, even if you lead them by the hand, you know, they'll come with you, you lead them by the hand. But if you let them go on their own, and you find out, oh, no, they're heading into the road, you don't have to really do much except turn their body, and then they'll just keep running wherever else that they're going. You know what I'm talking about? Because they just keep running. Wherever it is, I'm running there. You just have to kind of turn their bodies. Even though the parent is not actually leading that person by the hand, they have changed the direction in which that child is now heading in order that that child would avert danger. And so I want you to think of leading not only as leading by the hand, but leading when it comes to turning you in a different path. Look what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 20. And this is when uh, the Lord is speaking to his people regarding Pharaoh not being willing to let his people go. And he says, So I will stretch my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. You see, I don't want you to make it, I don't want to make it sound like God's hands is not is not is only one in which that heal, so to speak. It's also a hand, which I found out too, is one that's used to discipline. Because what ends up happening is Pharaoh gets the chance to respond to the words of God's man, saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh, in his stubbornness, his obstinate attitude, says, no, who are you? Who is it that's saying you, you're gonna, you, you, you get to go? And God says, I guess he's not getting the message. I need to change his way of thinking. I need to change his direction. The only way I'm going to get to that is if I stretch out my hand and put a plague in the land of Egypt that they would understand. Hopefully he gets it after one. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? God's hands are also used to stretch out in order to change your direction, Pharaoh. You didn't get it the first time, number one. You didn't get it the second time, number two. You didn't get it the third time, fourth time, fifth time. Then you finally say, okay, I'll let you go. It's like, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to actually let you go. Sixth time, seventh time, eighth time. God's stretching out his hand over the land of Egypt time after time, giving them opportunity to change. What is it in your life that God is saying, I'm stretching out my hand on you right now, and I'm putting something in your life so that you will change your direction, young person? 
You've been complaining and making excuses, but it's actually God using his hand. You're running into danger, and God is saying, turn so that you can avert the danger. i got to keep turning you, and I'm putting things in your life, experiences in your life, so that you will change direction. God stretches his hands to lead out in a way that may, for those that turn away from him, seem tough. It may seem like a plague. I hope we get it after one plague. God's hands are used to lead us to avert danger to find himself. And that's why he says in Isaiah 65 verse 2, I've spread out my hands, how long? All day long to a obedient people. No, to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is what? Not good. That is the point. Again, you're running into danger. That's why God is saying, The good way happens to be my way. I want you to go in my way because it is the good way, not just because it's my way, because it is the best way. And he spreads his hand all day long. There's a young person, there's an older person, there's a middle-aged person who I've been, God's been reaching his hand out all day long. And all you keep doing as he reaches out his hand to you is just keep keep slapping it away. And God keeps reaching out all day long. Because if I was God, after the first step, I'd be like, well, good luck. Go ahead. Go into your little danger. But God say, I'm, I'm reaching out my hand. I know you're rebellious people, but that, that doesn't stop me from reaching out to you. That's what I see about God's hands here. Young person, you think God's given up on you? Uh, more likely, you've given up on God. He will find ways to reach out to you. But if you constantly slap the hand that's been feeding you, What else is there to do? God says, you're following your own thoughts. You're walking in a way that is not good. That's why I'm reaching out to you. Hear me, my child. God uses his hands to lead. And he literally says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9, on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. What was Egypt? Egypt was a place of slavery, of oppression, of injustice of a place where they were third-class citizens. They weren't citizens. Third-class people. And God led them by the hand. Think of that child that you've taken. Use your hands for. I want you to think of the things you you used your hands for. Think about that time, father or mother, when you were walking your your child down that path in Brighton Gardens in Wheaton Park. That time you were walking down the beach, just leading them. You saw the ocean. You made sure they weren't going to run in but you were holding them by the hand, leading them. God says the same thing about Egypt. says, like, my child, I'm the one that took you out of the place when you were in that place you shouldn't have been. I was trying to lead you out when you had that problem with alcohol, with drugs, with, 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 with vaping. And I'm the one that's trying to lead you out of the land of Egypt, out of the oppression, out of the shackles. Will you grasp my hand as well? God's hands are used to lead where? In order to save us. In order to save us. His hands aren't just leading us because he loves us, but because he wants to save us because of his love. Psalm 59 verse 1 says, The Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. You think the Lord's hand is short? No, 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 no. It, it's, it's, it's one of those go-go gadget arms. Even some of you don't know that expression. It's from Inspector Gadget from many years ago. Go-go gadget arms. Others of you, it's like those dull seam arms. You guys don't, some of you don't know, but some of you do know what I'm talking about. Those arms that can stretch out because his arms aren't so short that it cannot save. In other words, my arms are long enough that it can save. Why? Because they're everlasting arms. Would you just lean on my everlasting arms? I can save you. I can reach out and touch you from the pit you're in. Don't think that I cannot save you, but you do need to look up. We find ourselves in the same predicament as bold, brash Peter. As the disciples went on their way uh, in the boat, and God, the Lord Jesus had sent them away, he comes up a little later at night, and they're like, oh my, 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 what is that, a ghost? It's a ghost out there. And he's like, chill, it's me. And then Peter's like, hey, yo, it's, it's, it's Jesus. Jesus, call me out there. Can I come? I, I want to walk on water too. 
And then I'm sure all the other disciples are like, what are you, what are you crazy? But this is Peter. Bold, brash Peter. Peter says, all right, I'm going. I'm going. He steps out in the water. Yo, look at this. Standing on water. And he goes down. And what ends up happening there? It says immediately Jesus did what? Reached out his hand and caught him. I, I, my, in parentheses, I'm putting saved him. And he says, you of little faith, why do you doubt? You see, I wonder in my mind how that all played out. If the waters were a little boisterous or if they weren't, I mean the depths of where they were, it's not like they were at shore. Or else they wouldn't be surprised that Jesus was walking. It was like, oh, he's just standing in the sand. No, they were in deep waters. How is it that the Lord in that time of the night was able to just be like, mm, gotcha. The wet arm, the, and again, if you've ever been in the ocean, it moves. <laughs> okay? That's the way it is, and especially at night. There's a tide that comes with the moon. Look it up on if you guys don't remember the science from in your high schools. Um, I, don't, I can't imagine that it was completely calm. But even so, in the midst of it, his wet, drenched arm, as he's going down again, when you're wet, you're a little heavier as well, but it helps. Jesus is standing above the water. And he reaches out and somehow finds a way to grab this brash man from his little faith, little faith, I'll call him little faith Peter, and pulls him out and gets him back to the boat. The Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. Even in the midst of that difficult situation you're in right now, even in the times when you feel it's because of my pride that I've now sunk into the depths of the ocean, God says, my hand is not so short that it cannot save. I will save you. But you got to reach out a little bit. I need your arm to reach out. But just to let me know you want me to save you. And God did so. His hands reach out to save. They are not so short that they cannot save. What hands, what are your hands being used for? We're going to find at the end of this sermon, uh, Christ may not be on the earth physically anymore but he's put ambassadors on the earth that they would be his hands as well. Are your hands reaching out to save even the person that's in the most, the, the most proud, difficult person that God has put in your life, that God's saying, I want you to reach out and save this person. It could be one person your whole life. And I, I don't want you, I'm, I'm going to take a little time. I'm taking a little extra time. I hope those online are okay with this. I'm going to take, take 10 minutes extra today because I'm putting two sermons together. And it's kind of my last sermon before I go to Texas. I'll still be back, but so give me, give me, give me a little grace. I, I asked for that. When we find ourselves reaching out to somebody, I think to myself, or we, we can think to ourselves, well, my, 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 my pastor John has probably saved, you know, how many people he's baptized? Dozens and dozens and dozens. How many people say that? I've, 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 I've only reached out to one person. It could be that your entire life, God has only asked you to reach out and save that one person. Don't belittle the fact. There is no comparative numbers. Let's not look at this like COVID cases. Oh, they have so many more. No, no, no. Don't get stats. There's no stat line in God's, God's books. It's have they done what I asked. I've given you five talents. What have you done with the five? I've given you one. What have you done with the one? It may be that you will reach out to the person that will be the next Paul in this world. You don't know that. But because of your influence in their life, they now, ooh, they have an opportunity to be used by God. Don't belittle the fact of the small things you, do may, you may do in your homes, mothers and fathers. You may be raising up the next Peter. You may be raising up the next Hannah. The one that will reach out, that will devote their lives to the Lord. So don't belittle that fact. I want you to keep that in mind. Who is it that you're reaching out to save? You don't have to save the whole world. Just reach out to the people that God has put into your life. Finally, let's go into his feet. All right, I took a little five minutes longer. Um, let's talk about this. What about his feet? What is it? We saw what his hands did. They healed. They led. They saved. That's what he was doing. What is it that your hands do? But what about his feet? Where is it that God went? What is it that God did with his feet? I like what Mrs. White says in Desire of Ages, page 642. She says, but we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, or to Bethany, 
in order to walk in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his footprints beside the sickbed, in the hovels of poverty. Hovels are like small houses, the shelters of poverty. In the crowded alleys of the great city. And in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. We found his footsteps in every place where human hearts were in need of consolation, in need of comfort. Let's see, what, let's see if that, that, that matches up. I'll propose to you that his feet walked, we'll go with what Mrs. White said, where there was need. He walked where there was need. Because there was need, I propose to you, in the church. We'll see where and where he walked there. Need outside of the church and the global need of the world. His feet walked in all those places. Let's see what they did there. Number one, in the church. Matthew 21, verses 12 and 14. Remember, Jesus went to cleanse the temple. Well, we understand, biblical scholars agree, go went twice. Once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end of his ministry. We find the first one in John chapter 2, I want to say. Yeah, John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And then we also find it in Matthew chapter 21. And in Matthew 21, it says that Jesus went. Let's, I'm going to put the word walked because he probably didn't go in there on a hoverboard or something like that. I'm pretty sure he walked into the temple. So we'll say, then Jesus walked into the temple of God. And what did he do? Do what did he do? He drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. Let's stop right there. We find Jesus going into the temple, into the church, because there was a need. What was the need? To overturn something that should not have been going on in his temple. Let's be real. Some of the most scathing words of Jesus came to church people. You brood of vipers. Those were, that's what he said to the, the teachers of the law, you know, priests, the, the, what we would think of as priests, the people who knew the Bible, who knew the Pentateuch. And here he comes and he walks and he says, I'm walking into the temple because this is not supposed to be taking place. What's happening here is the exploitation of the poor. What is happening here is you've turned my house of prayer into a den of thieves. Where there should be giving, there is now thievery. Where there is love, there is now greed. And so Jesus sometimes has to walk in to these places of the church, into our own hearts, into our own churches, and say, i got to overturn some things. You've lost sight of where I had wanted you to go. Instead of being there for the poor, you are exploiting the poor. Instead of healing the blind, you are taking advantage of the blind. Instead of being a place where you can find consolation, this is the place where you can find greed. And Jesus said, nah, -uh. I'm taking my feet into those halls of that temple, and I got to change things. But he doesn't end there. You know, you can find people who all they want to do is find what's wrong with the church, right? Uh, they're, they're the people, that, oh, they shouldn't, they shouldn't have a glass one. They should have a one that actually has this. Oh, they shouldn't have this picture. They should have some other picture. They shouldn't have a, that kind of piano. They should be a smaller piano. Uh, and then they leave. Oh, these people have everything wrong. But Jesus, what he does is he overturns the table. And then look what the next line says. Then the blind, and this is verse 14, then the blind and lame came to him in the temple. Juxtapose those two things. He doesn't just overturn and say, all right, guys, I'll see you later. That was fun, and I'll be back next week for another overturning of the tables. No. He cleanses the temple, and he stays in the temple in order to minister to the people that should have been there in the first place. The lame, the blind, the poor, those in need of consolation. That's where he found his feet, staying. Sometimes, and we're going to talk about this during our youth Sabbath, you need to be the change instead of just asking for the change. People are great at asking for change. They're great at making excuses and making complaints. But they are poor performers of their own complaints. They have a lot of ideas. They have a lot of things to say about people and about how things are done. But boy, if you ask them to do something and say, why don't you be that loving person? Oh, no, that's not my thing, you know, no i got to go to the next church and complain. 
don't find yourself doing that because Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't just walk into church to make complaints. He walks into church in order that God will be um, uh, praised and glorified and stays there and says, I'm here for the lame, the blind, and the poor because that's what the church should have been for in the beginning. He walks into the temple in order to fill the need of the temple. Does that speak to you? That's where you find Jesus walking. But he didn't just stay in the temple. We find also, um, we find also, when he's in the temple, he, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say this again. He quotes Isaiah chapter 49, verse 2, when he comes in and they said, why don't you say something for church today? And they're like, okay. He gave me, they gave him the Isaiah scroll and he preaches something. He says, this has been now fulfilled in the hearing of your ears. When he says, what did I come here to do? To preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He walked into the church and said, this is what I'm here to do. When you walk into the church, what is it that you're here to do? I hope it's not just to hear a sermon or a song, but I hope it's so that you'll be energized and encouraged to preach good news to the poor, to use your feet to do what Jesus did, to go and talk to the brokenhearted, to, to help the blind, to help those that have less. That's what we find him doing. Then we find him going outside of the church. I'll use just one example, one example here. Um, and he's talking about, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 32. I'm going to read it very quickly. This is when Jesus is brought into the temple uh, to be uh, on the eighth day. And here we find Simeon, who is a devout man, comes and sees Jesus. He's been waiting for the Messiah all this time. And he, 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 he says to Jesus, quoting what's found in uh, Isaiah 49, verse 6. And he says, here is a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Already, from the time of Isaiah, God had in his mind that his feet were going to go where the Israelites just could not, would not do it. They wanted to keep the gospel to themselves. They wanted to keep God to themselves. And God said, I'm going to bring a light to the Gentiles. I'm, going to, I'm using you to reach out to them. You're not doing it. Well, I will come and show you what needs to be done. And in one instance, of course, Jesus went to many places, Jerusalem, Galilee, Judea, all places belonging to his people. But we also find what Jesus did with his feet. John chapter 4 verse 3 says, He left Judea and departed again to go to Galilee. But he needed to go, let's say walk through Samaria. They didn't have cars back then, FYI. They walked. Uh, he would walk there. Now, this is interesting because I've mentioned this before, and you may already know, those of you that uh, are, are familiar with this. In order to go from Judea to Galilee, you didn't need to go through, through uh, Samaria. Often, what the Jews would do, because they wanted to uh, avoid the, what they called half-breeds, these kind of fake Jew people. They're, they're actually Gentiles, you know. Um, they don't really believe what we believe. They don't have the truth. They would go around Samaria Take the long, circuitous route in order to avoid that area. So Jesus could have also done that and gone around Samaria in order to get to the place he was going to. But it says, the Bible says he needed to go there. Why? Because there was a woman at the well that needed to hear something. There was a people that she was, he was going to use her to reach. I always find that interesting. Why couldn't Jesus have gone to just preach to the people? Or the first thing he does is he finds someone. Remember I talked about the first time. You may be in this world just to reach that one person because that one person has the ability and God has chosen them to go reach everyone else. You didn't have to go bypass them and reach everyone else. God said, go reach that person and then they'll go do it. Still just as important. Jesus says, I need to walk through Samaria because there's a woman waiting at a well for me right now in midday. And I need to go talk to her because I'm reaching outside of the church. That's where my feet will go. And when the disciples come to find him talking to a strange woman, that to a Samaritan in the middle of the day by himself, like, what are you doing? And Jesus says, you have no clue. Sometimes we find ourselves thinking the same thing. Where is it that we need to go to walk outside of the church, to find ourselves in those places? It doesn't have to be far. But where is it that God calls you to go? outside of the church, just the way that Christ himself went. Finally, I'm going to close up here. Actually, the time is 
going away from me. There was a need in the world. There are needs in the church. There are needs outside of the church. There is a general need in the world, no matter where you are. And that's why our Lord, our Savior, he went, the Bible says on John chapter 19, verse 17, and he, bearing his cross, went, let's say walked. He walked to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Those same feet that had walked through Judea and Capernaum, that had gone to Jerusalem, who had gone to the temple, that had met with those people. The same feet that walked through Samaria now walks in the path of Via Dolorosa, the way of grief. And he's walking now those same feet to Golgotha to be crucified. That's where his feet Because why? There was a need in the world. They, some of them, didn't even realize they had a need. That their sins needed to be forgiven. That someone had to pay the price. But there was a need in the world, so he took his feet where no other feet could have paid the price. Only his feet could walk to those places where he would be crucified for your sin and my sin because his feet walks where there is need of consolation. And if anyone needs consolation, it's you and I because we need the forgiveness of our sins and Jesus paid the price for us. Desire of Ages, page 755 says, the spotless son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes from the flogging. Those hands so often, which we talked about, reached out in blessing now nailed to the wooden bars, those feet so tireless on ministries of love, now spiked to the tree. Remember those hands and feet we were talking about when you no longer have them? Jesus gave them up that he, his hands would be nailed for your need. You see, his hands would go where there was need. His feet would go where there was need. And the final need, this big, huge need of the world, could only be be paid by the beautiful hands and feet of Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's why he says in 49, verse 16, to his people in Israel, he says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Those same hands that reached out to cleanse the leper. Those same hands that reached out to heal the blind man. Those hands that broke bread and served the needs of thousands. Now nailed to a cross. And he says to you, I've engraved you, my son, my daughter, in the palms of my hand. Yvonne, I have graved you engraved you in the palms of my hand. Do you remember what I've done? My feet have been spiked for you, Dow. My hands have been nailed for you, Elizabeth and Kenva. They are done for you. Luke, do you know that my palms are engraved with your name? His feet and his hands were pierced due to his love. For you, and there's no denying it. And my question, as we conclude for today, is what are you doing with that knowledge? It's no for, for, uh, far gone conclusion for you to realize what all God has done for you in his life. There is someone within the hearing of my voice right now, 20 years ago, you didn't care for God. 20 years ago, you thought God didn't exist. You actually, for, you went away from him and you lived a life of drugs and all sorts of other things. And now you find yourself listening to the sermon and say, wow, I need to remember what God has done for me. Yes, he died for me. He reached out his hand and saved me. That's the only reason I'm here today to be able to worship with the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. But that's not enough. The acknowledgement of God's sacrifice in our lives as a church is not enough. He then says, God says, what are you doing with your hands and your feet? When I was growing up, um, those of you that don't know, I have a brother and a sister, older brother, older by eight years, and an older sister, older by 11 years. Needless to say, because of that age gap, I was easily manipulated. They often took advantage of the fact that I was so young. So when I was like four or five years old, maybe five or six, you know, my sister is now... 16, 17, you know, 
old enough to know how to get things done. And so they would use this game on me. Uh, my sister would be in the living room, let's say, and she says, oh, I forgot a pen. I need to write down a note. But her pen is in her room upstairs. I happen to be there. You know, I'm five or six years old. She's a, hey, Reggie, I, I bet you can't go and get a pen in 10 seconds. I'm like, oh, yes, I can. Remember, I love sports, so I can prove, prove a point, right? So I'm fast enough, Akka. I can do it. I can do it. I, I, don't know, I don't think you can. I don't think you can do it. Okay, let's try. And then she'll go time it. She's like, go. Now, she's not keeping track of time. Only I am. I'm running as fast as I can to get that pen, and I bring it back. I'm like, here, how fast is that? Oh, you did it under 10 seconds. Wow, that was really good, really good. Let's see if you can beat it for next time. She's already setting up for the next thing. Little do I know that this is a game where she's saying, why don't you be my hands and feet right now? I'm going to be here. You go ahead and be my hands and feet and do what I need. Now, God doesn't manipulate us. But he does say, I want you to be my hands and feet. You know, and little beknownst to me, I didn't care. I, at the end of the day, I probably wouldn't even care if she was manipulating me because I had fun running as fast as I can to get the thing I needed. When God sends us on missions of mercy, how excited we should be. He said, God's using me as his hands and feet. He could use an angel. He could use a prophet. No, he's using me, this little old me, to be his hands and feet to do something. Church, what is it? Are our hands reaching out? to those that are brokenhearted, those that are in captivity, to drugs and addiction and alcohol and different types of things in the world. Are our hands reaching out, are our feet going to the young person who hasn't been to church in a long time and saying to them, I'm preaching to myself and saying to them, I'm here. I'll come where you are because I know you won't be where I am here. And that's what Jesus said. I'm not going just in the church. I got to go outside the church because people are never going to find themselves in the temple. I got to go where they are. If we are his hands and if we are his feet, what are we doing? I'm not asking each of us to be uh, 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 televangelists or um, missionaries that have to go to far off countries. I'm saying within your own spheres of influence, what are your hands and feet doing? And as a church, are we willing to reach out to the untouchables? Are we willing to reach out and touch them and let them know that they have a place here? I didn't read the end of that, that um, um, the little quote I had from Ellen White. We talked about the hovels of poverty. In every place, Jesus' footprints were there where there were hearts in need of consolation. The last line of that actually says, in doing as Jesus did when on earth, we shall walk in his footsteps. You want to walk in his footsteps? That's what we need to do, church. We need to find ourselves beside the sick bed when we can. When the pandemic is over, there will be a time. Elders walking into the hearts, into the homes of those that need some encouragement. One song says, with every act of love, we bring the kingdom come. God put a million, million doors in the world for his love to walk through. But one of those doors is you. But how often do we leave that door closed? not allowing God's love to walk through it. In fact, we just complain, we're bemoaning that we have to do this, that, and the other. The world is coming to an end and all these things. And God's saying, I'm trying to make my love walk through. You're wondering why your prayers aren't answered. I've talked about this before. But one of them might be because you keep shutting the door of love that God's trying to walk through. You've been just at home by yourself, feeding yourself on the word when you could actually send a message to somebody and stop using the pandemic as an excuse for not being there for somebody. You can call somebody. These things still work for phone calls. I know it's hard for young people to believe, but they do. Sometimes a voice is what needs to be heard. Me and my friends, you and I, as we study the body of God, you and I are the body, not just as the church, but as individuals, as his literal hands and literal feet. And when he says, I need you to go get a pen from upstairs, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to use my hands and my feet to get that pen. Have you only taken the time to look and touch his hands yet not extend your hands to heal a broken heart, to lead a wayward friend back home, or save a lost soul? Have you only taken the time to cry at his crucified feet, yet not take your own feet into the church to be a blessing, out of the church to be a blessing, or walked in the place of someone else's shoes? If we are the body, our hands must reach like his did, and our feet must go where his did, beside the sickbed, where there is poverty, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. 
Yes, we can say, thank you, Lord, for what your hands and feet have done. Now use my hands and my feet as yours. May your mind be full of humility. May your eyes see the person that is hidden, who is the unseen. May your ears hear the cries of the afflicted, of the voiceless. May your love be one that heals, that's active, that restores, and is thorough. And may your hands and your feet be used by God. You see, when we look at the body of God, we shouldn't say, oh, great, what a great body he had. No, 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 no. We see it and we say, that's the body he wants to give me. That's why by beholding, we become changed. Lord, if we are the body, our hands will reach, our feet will go, and our words will say, there is a way. Jesus is the way. in trying to fade into the faces the girls teasing laughter is carrying farther than they know farther than they know but if we are the body why aren't his arms reaching why aren't And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is a way? There is a way. A traveler is far away from home. He sheds his coat and quietly sinks into the back row. The weight of their judgmental glances tells him that his chances are better out on the road. But if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is a way? Jesus paid much too high a price us to pick and choose who should come. We are the body of Christ. If we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is a way? If we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way.
Let's pray. Our gracious and merciful and loving Heavenly Father, use us, Lord. Forgive us for the times when we've used our hands and our feet to do that which we please. I pray, Lord, that we will now choose to allow you to direct our hands and our feet. Teach us, Lord, as a church as a whole and individuals, that you will be the one that will direct our hands, that will reach out to heal, to lead, to save somebody that our feet will go to the places that you want us to go. So I pray that you'll be with, with Bettina and be with Yvonne and Dow and, and Luke, for Rose and Elrita and Sonny, that you'll be with all of those within the hearing of my voice, that we will now use our hands and our feet in the way that you did. May we truly be the body of Christ so that we will be able to herald your second coming, that we would find ways to go about doing good the way that you did. No matter the circumstance, no matter the pandemic, no matter the limitations, that we will find ways as a church, as a whole, and individuals to find ways to reach out and show people that you are the way. Bless us to that end, Lord. Use us, I pray, mightily, because we know your coming is very soon. Thank you for choosing to use us. May we be humble and realize it is only by your power and your grace that many will be saved, not through ours. So use us as your vessel to do your bidding, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining with us here at the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church, your church family here in Burtonsville, Maryland, in the United States of America. We hope that you were blessed by your time worshiping with us, whether it was through our song service, whether it was through the prayer, uh, special music, a children's story, a sermon. We pray that you were blessed and brought closer to the Lord, and that your time spent with us is not one in which you just were able to say, well, that was nice, but one in which you actually grew closer to the Lord. And today we talked about God's hands and feet. That his hands were ones that reached out to heal, to lead, and to save. And that his feet went where there was need. And the need was there in the church, outside of the church, and the need of the world. Where is it that your hands and feet have been used? As we look at his nail-pierced hands and feet, may we see them, appreciate the sacrifice that was made each and every day, and then say, God, use me as your hands and feet. I haven't reached out the way you would reach out. I've been reaching out to the people I'm comfortable with, but there's someone you have put in my life that I really need to reach out to. Pray about it. Ask God for an opportunity to be able to use your hands and feet to be able to minister to someone, to save them. Maybe that's the person you're here that God has placed you in their life for a particular reason and is because you're the one that will present them that Jesus is the way. I pray that you are blessed and that this week you will find yourselves looking at your hands and feet in a different way. <laughs> that you'll realize that they are given to us, yes, to do our tasks and the work and then all those other things that we have, but also to further God's kingdom. I want to say a special welcome and hello and happy Sabbath to those of you joining us online, all of our members. Uh, we have also Vasantha, Juanita, Mehareth, Corinne, Barbara. We have Ponzi, uh, Elrita joining us from Ireland. We have Clifton, 
uh, Sonny Jack and family from St. Vincent, Dow as always worshiping with us from Saskatchewan, Yvonne uh, joining us from uh, Philadelphia, Joseph, Kenva, and many others. My mom and dad, Raj and Grace Samuel, joining us from uh, Pragasapuram, India. We thank each of you for joining with us, and we pray that you'll continue to have a closer walk with the Lord. As a reminder, uh, your contributions, whether through prayer, financial, your letters that you write to us, are all greatly appreciated. And as I mentioned today, uh, as Pastor mentioned today, we want to be able to be doing more with our hands and feet as a remnant Seventh-day Adventist church as a whole. And in that way, we're thinking of ways outside of the box to be able to reach outside of the church to the world. And to do so, it does take funds. And so we appreciate all of you that are able to financially contribute to the ministry here at the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. As we seek to find ways to enhance our worship, but also to go to communities and reach out to communities that we haven't been able to at this time. So if you have a burden on your heart and this blessing and this church has been a blessing to you, and you've grown close to the Lord because of it, we humbly ask that you'll visit our church website and click on the tab for giving and make a financial contribution, whatever it may be. We truly appreciate it. Or if you're more comfortable, you can send a check to our church mailing address, which is also on our church website. Thank you for your continued prayers. We pray that this ministry will grow more and more and that more will be reached. Lastly, join us back at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our prayer and praise service. I'll be back here with you. If you want to sing some songs uh, from our hymn books, just join in, send in your live request or your prayer request. We take those very seriously that we can pray for you. And those around the world will also know and hopefully keep you in your prayer as well. So join us at 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And we will see you then. And if we don't, we'll see you next week. Have a great rest of the week. Have a happy Sabbath. And may God use your hands and feet for his kingdom.